the biggest thing is, is changing that relationship with failure. What failure really means, what failure actually looks like, and what is it? Because if someone perceives failure as a negative, what's going to happen is there's a part of their brain called the habenula which gets activated, which tracks how many failures you have, and, and there, there's a survival mechanism. And it also controls your motivation. Because the only really true way to fail is to fall out of effort. Any coach that has done real work with clients will tell you this. So the only way a client can ever fail is falling out of effort. Is are people staying in effort or do they have that growth mindset? Are they willing to keep trying and working at it? Because if you fail less, that's also progress. If I binge 3,000 calories this weekend for two days in a row and then next weekend I binge only one day for 3,000 calories, I made a huge amount of progress. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I'm super fired up today to have the one and only Mario Tomic with me today. Uh, Mario, I just want to start by saying thanks for uh, having a hell of a day. Now it's 9 p.m. in Barcelona, and I appreciate you spending the time with me here today to finish off your uh, your Wednesday. Thank you for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure. Yeah, man. It's going to be, going to be a lot of fun. Um, so the way I kind of want to start today, Mario, is before you kind of jumped into the fitness industry in about 2011 or so, you were a software developer and system admin after getting a master's degree in computer science. And you were kind of living that lifestyle for a while. And then if I'm, if I did my research correctly in about 2011, you kind of jumped in to health and fitness. So what was kind of the primary motivator or the primary spark for you to kind of make that transition? Yeah, for me, fitness was really never on the radar as I grew up and I was going through high school and college. Fitness was not really something I had a lot of interest in, no idea about nutrition. Uh, my family also wasn't really into that kind of stuff. You know, my mom makes whatever her mom made and just basically, you know, passing on some of that traditional um, way we approach life. And you just kind of go in a certain path. Parents loved the fact that, you know, studying computer science, being an engineer is sort of a prestigious thing. You're either an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. So those are the three things you can be in life at least what we knew back then and of course uh, you know making a leap into you know, what I did in fitness and becoming an entrepreneur eventually what was a really big move uh, but to backtrack I was I mean really overweight at, at one point in my life due to being addicted to video games I was a World of Warcraft player before that I played on real tournament that's really old school back in the 2000s and in college so uh, I really you know the health side of things just got out of hand so I really had to make a change I decided okay time to do something about this and then I realized there's a a lot of similarities between World of Warcraft and gaming and actually doing things for yourself and your fitness and self-care. And then I realized there's a, this leveling progression type of uh, mentality as well that's required. You go to the gym, you you hit your squats. Next time you increment by two and a half pounds. Next time you increment by five. Next time you do this and that. So there's, there's a level of progression improvement. And I'm thinking, well, if I'm leveling up all these characters, why not let, just level myself up in my life and try to make something out of this? And there's also a unique opportunity, me going back, to my to my hometown after college where you know how it is in college you have sort of an environment that dictates a lot of your behaviors and um it was a lot of drinking partying you know the standard yeah. stuff you know you're not really paying a lot of attention to to self-care you're not really taking life as seriously that, mm -hmm. that that's what i was doing and then uh, that shift in the environment kind of offered me an opportunity to reinvent myself and I started getting into personal development. I was starting to get into Tony Robbins. I was starting to read more about this and started this triangle of, of, of success in a way that you have the career or business and you have your health and then you have your relationships. So kind of working in all those three areas. And uh, then I got caught in the fitness bug. And, and really since then, it, it's honestly been something that I developed a deep passion for. I'd be doing this stuff anyway. So it's just the fact that I can make it a business as well mine and, and make an impact through it is incredible. So I just feel extremely privileged and grateful for that. But I, would, I would be training, I'd be eating right. I think it's just my you know, one vehicle that I got this body, I got to take care of it. And, and to be able to take care of others and to be able to add value in the world, there's really no other way to, other than being healthy and being on top of your game. I love it, man. I love it. So was there a particular kind of jump off point though that made that made you okay with making it like this is my full-time career because a lot of times that can be a little bit you know scary after having a little bit of a a different job you know a little bit more of a job with more security if you will so was there kind of a jump off point and, and what was that like 
Absolutely. That what you just mentioned there, job security, that's one of the things that I mean, I come from a very conservative culture. And we've gone through in the 90s, we got with a war situation, my family was also very kind of, you know, cautious, safe, let's play it safe. Let's not take many chances here. I'm the first person in my family to ever graduate. I've been they invested a lot of in me over the years. And they had kind of those hopes, I'm going to build a good career and just kind of live life out in a nice, peaceful way. And then I mean, shifting from that to becoming an entrepreneur and taking a big risk was really something outside of my comfort zone. But one of the reasons for that is not just me, but also the fact that you know, family didn't really understand. I mean, I'm, again, I'm the first entrepreneur again to do something like this. So especially on the, on the English market, because I mean, back then I didn't live um, anywhere in, in the West. I lived back in Croatia, like close to my family. So that, that was a really big leap. So yeah, it, it, one of those things that it, it, I mean, I felt like I'm in my twenties. I can't really, and if I, if everything goes to hell, I'm still able to recover, right? That's kind of my thought process. And I feel like a lot of people don't realize the fact that when you're in your twenties, you can really try out a lot of different things. And the fact that I did finish that computer science degree, I think it gave me a unique perspective on fitness that most other people that I've seen didn't really have. Because when I first started fitness, I was already viewing it from a scientific lens. I was already seeing it as a process. I was seeing it as a set of systems and variables and things you can change and alter and measure and, and you use more data-driven methods to get results. But back in 2011 or 2012, when I was starting it was a lot of bro science. I mean, these days, if you go on YouTube, there's a lot of you know, science-based this and that. There's a lot of research studies and it's getting a bit more popular. But if you go back, rewind a decade, it was in very, very early stages. So I really could kind of sense there's a lot of value to be added there. And then obviously in a few years, as I built myself up, transformed my body and, and really got super deep into this stuff, I realized, okay, there, there's something I can bring to the table here. It's not, I'm just not just some random guy. I can actually offer a different perspective on things. And I love this thing and I can see myself doing it long-term and let's give yeah. it a try, right? I didn't know what was going to happen. Obviously, nobody knows, like most entrepreneurs fail and that's just the reality of the situation. But I felt like, like I'm going to give this a, a proper go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit my year to it and see what happens. Yeah, man. I acknowledge you for being able to make that take that leap of faith being kind of the first entrepreneur in your family and uh, taking on that risk. So that's, that's awesome. When in like your personal fitness journey, did you make this jump? Cause like you said, you, you were you, earlier on, you were over, you were overweight at being really into video games and probably sitting on your ass a lot of the time. Um, had you already lost a lot of weight and like we're in pretty darn good shape and like okay i i just want to now give this back to other people or like what kind of point in this fitness journey were you when you made the decision to like become a trainer i was already in, in really really good shape so it okay. took me i was trained three four years already undergone my transformation i pretty much got pretty in pretty um, incredible shape in terms of like my standards, like where I came from, because I was totally out of shape. And I, okay, I realized I'm, I'm pretty, I'm decently strong. I look good. I feel good. Now I got something to bring to the table for the people. I can inspire them, especially fellow engineers. And in that field, I've seen a lot of people, even in their thirties, they were just really struggling. And that if you're in your twenties and your thirties, I mean, there are guys, you know, 40, 50 pounds, 60 pounds are overweight and really struggling because of the lifestyle. It's really a lifestyle thing. And I, and I know this lifestyle very, I mean, closely because I lived it. You're sitting all day, you're, you're at a computer all day. I mean, I'm also at a computer a lot of the days. I mean, everybody's these days, but as an engineer, it, it's literally all that. And there, the activity right. level feels like so out of your character. If you want to do anything, you want to go to the gym, you want to do something with sport, sports related, you're just kind of like, this is not me, right? I'm the nerdy guy. That's kind of what I used to think. I'm the nerdy guy. I'm the guy that plays video games for fun. I'm not the guy that goes out there that, you know, goes and try to socialize or play sports or do anything. So being, building that layer on top of my identity and my personality, I think that was a big, big transition. So that took a long time. I mean, initially you also have doubts. You have sort of this imposter syndrome, you know, can I even help people? And then about three, four years in, I first started helping people for free. You know, really seeing if I can actually make a change in another person because getting someone else results and getting yourself results are two totally different things. I think someone who hasn't been a coach, they don't realize that 
you know, humans are not just rational and we're not robots. We can just we can't just tell someone, hey, just do this, and it's just gonna do it, right? It, it's much more complicated than that. So once I had kind of proof of concept. I started thinking, well, I'm going to start taking on more clients and I moved into that role. And then of course it expanded from there. And today I'm again, super happy where I'm at. Yeah, man. Uh, and I'm glad that you brought up the fact that, you know, humans aren't robots and, and you brought up the fact that you had to like change your identity. You know, you, you were kind of saw yourself as this person as who was the nerdy person, not really that athletic, not going outside and, and doing that sort of thing. That's not you, but, and, and I think a lot of people experience that because I think a lot of people, their biggest hurdle is being able to envision themselves as the type of person who really prioritizes working out and really prioritizes eating healthy. Because I think a lot of people see other people doing that and see other people meal prepping, see other people spending hours in the gym. And they're like, that's not me. That's never going to be, can't do that. But so talk a little bit more about how maybe you help coach people in trying to help them not just with the X's and O's reps and sets here's the nutrition education but like kind of develop that different sense of identity so that they can start changing their lifestyle that's a great question because this what you're what you're mentioning now is I think the missing piece for a lot of people because we all know look you gotta eat less calorie deficit you're gonna lose weight right if you eat healthy it's good for you if you eat extreme amounts of processed food is bad for it. we kind of have some basic understanding of what's good and what's bad but then actually implementing that and doing that consistently showing up consistently is a huge problem really understanding what you're doing so um, first and foremost that fear and you know just being not familiar with it it's a sign of lack of competence in one sense because if you've actually done it you realize then you start building some confidence and you realize okay it's not a big deal i can actually do this i mean i have clients these days they're they're starting to train in their 40s they're training in their 50s uh, again i didn't grow up trained and into sports i started in when i was in my 20s like early to mid 20s so it was far out of my identity and i see people making the leap now in their 40s 50s they're seeing it as i saw it it's inevitable you have to add it to your life now if you know you have to add it to your life, you can have a couple of choices here. One, you can see it as a chore. You can dread it every single moment of the time you did it. And you probably do that, but maybe it's not going to work long term for you. I don't know many people that can do that. Or you can develop a better relationship with fitness and, and health and start seeing it and start to find joy and in, in, in some way that you can enjoy the process. Because at the end of the day, it has to be in your life. I don't see a reality where fitness is out of your life. How yeah. else would you be your best self? I mean, it depends on your goals. Obviously, you can't, not everybody's at the same level. I mean, as a coach, you learn for very quickly that if someone doesn't want to change their ways, it's, I mean, you can't really do much there, right? We, we can only show the path. We can help people guide them who are committed and they want to make a positive impact and change in their life. But you can't really get someone from, you know, random from the street that doesn't want to do anything and suddenly tell them one thing that's going to change everything. So I think those that are ready, that they, they can get out of their comfort zone and just take the first steps. Those will be then a, a good student at the end of the day, being coachable in a sense that he can actually guide them through this process and slowly build up those habits in there, build up the competence. And that way they are going to feel a little bit more home in the gym they're gonna feel like okay this is within my realm of what i can do and then honestly when you start getting good at stuff you want to express that skill and then it gets easier to do that one thing for example i'll use a personal example i suck at dancing and i don't want to go dance i mean that those are two things that are related because if i was good at it i couldn't wait to go out there and the same thing is whatever you know most things that you're good at you want to keep doing if you're not good at it you try to avoid it as much as possible. So I think that making that leap there and the way I see it, I mean, I was eating anyway, I may as well learn how to do it right. And I, oh, I saw it as a challenge instead of seeing it as, as a, you know, some, some of these things that are outside of your control, feeling a victim of your environment or whatever. So I think taking control and making that leap and okay, I can make a change is the first prerequisite before we do anything here is that willingness to make a difference. And if you can do that, if you can bring that to the table, and then the information will actually work because you can give a thousand people their perfect programs and only a percentage of those will, will actually do something with it. It's yeah. not their perfect programs. It's, it's what state of mind they're in. So it, it does start with the mindset. It does start with the psychology and identify your limiting beliefs, what they are, 
and then challenging those limiting beliefs. Because if you bring real data to the to the equation, you realize, okay, this belief is not true, you can start working through them and remove them because they're causing that friction that's preventing change. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of great stuff in there. And kind of like you said in the beginning, I wholeheartedly believe too that education isn't the number one thing that holds people back from getting closer to their, their fitness goals and getting closer to the healthiest and, and best version of themselves. It's most of the time it's just execution. And most of the time it's just, it's just follow through. Um, and, and you mentioned some great things in regards to like having the right mindset, enjoying the process, not looking at it as a chore, looking at it as a challenge and that sort of thing. So like kind of along the same lines with clients that you've coached, what do you feel like is the difference between clients who are able to stay consistent over a long period of time? Because me and you both know, and most people, every, all people listening basically know that the people who are going to get results are the people who can stay consistent over a long period of time. So what's the difference between the person who is able to stay consistent versus the person who is two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off, that kind of thing? Yeah, there, there's not just one single thing there. Obviously, we can just start tackling this from different levels and, and layers and seeing what's going on there. I think one of the biggest challenges and roadblocks to people's success in this, first and foremost, is having the right expectations and, and having mm -hmm. the right approach to it from the, from the get-go. Um, I mean, a lot of people, again, education is not a problem, but they're also having an expectation they're going to lose 10 pounds a month or some really crazy thing where they're going to make that commitment. And obviously that commitment, you can't follow through on it because it's completely unrealistic. Right. Uh, if you're going to do this, give it six months, give it a year and, and give it a year of a process. If you're too attached to the outcome, you're at a really, really high risk of failure because this journey, if you don't know the process, if you haven't mastered consistency, that is your priority number one. Results don't even matter unless you can be consistent. That's I mean, how I at least view it and how we view it with our clients. I mean, when, we, when I work with people directly and I have the honor of working with more than 600 people at this point and guide them through this process. And obviously, I mean, there, there's going to be those type A clients. They're going to just come in. They're going to crush it. They're going to just really have every, everything is going to be properly managed and everything is done. But then there's also clients that crush it, but they're imperfectly crushing it. So they're failing their way to success. And I don't think most people realize that there, there's nobody who's going to do it perfectly. And that, that's one of the big misconceptions here. Like you don't actually have to be perfect to succeed. And if you have that all or nothing black and white mindset, you're going to have a really hard time with consistency. That's what gets in the way because you will have, uh, let's say, an extra 200 calories today. Well, your mind is going to tell you, okay, now that that is over, you just blew it. So you're going to get a permission from your mind. Okay, let's take this weekend. Let's scratch it. Let's start on Monday. So you got a couple of things happening there. First and foremost, you have a catastrophizing. Right, your mind is going through a, what's called a cognitive distortion in psychology. It's taking 200 calories and now turning it into a story that is a disaster. It's the end of the world. You had 200 calories. The reality is 200 calories is just 200 calories. There's no story to it, but we give it a story. Mm -hmm. And whether it's real or not, it's affecting us. And then you have that fresh start bias, which is I'm going to start on Monday. And then, of course, you give yourself a license to just, just blow it three, four days. I think that the guys that are really crushing it, girls that are really crushing it, they've learned to fail their way to success, and they've learned to iterate over time, meaning that when they fail, they see that as data to iterate on their systems. This is the mindset that we teach. We found that to work uh, consistently is that mindset change. That's really what can get someone who's inconsistent to being consistent. It's a, It's factor of behavior change. It's not a factor of, of the program. Obviously, the program does play a role if you minimize the commitment. So for example, if you take someone who is failing at six days a week consistency, you go down to three days a week, they're going to crush it. But I mean, that, that's not majority of my clients train three to four days a week. I don't really have that many clients that can do six or seven. That I mean, that, that's usually people that are already committed to this. So yeah. for sort of the person that's making those three, four and still can't make that happen, I mean, you can try to go to 30 minutes. You can try the tiny habits method, you know, floss one, two, three at a time. What we found, though, the biggest thing is, is changing that relationship with failure. What failure really means, what failure actually looks like, and what is it? Because if someone perceives failure as a negative, what's going to happen is there's a part of their brain called the habenula, which gets activated, which tracks how many 
failures you have and, and it's there as a survival mechanism and also controls your motivation. So there's two functions of it. So if you keep failing at a thing, you subconsciously have your motivation deregulated and your low motivation levels. Now you wonder why am I not even looking to do it again? Why am I failing to try again? Because the only really true way to fail is to fall out of effort. Any coach that has done real work with clients will tell you this. So the only way a client can ever fail is falling out of effort. And there's a lot of good books written on this. You can, I mean, for people, the BJ Fogg's work, he's author behind Tiny Habits, got, got Atomic Habits, James Clear, there's uh, Kyra Bobinett's work. She wrote a really nice book called Well Designed Life. There's a, there's a bunch of material out there and it boils down to a lot of different similar things is are people staying in effort or do they have that growth mindset if Carol Dweck's work, again, it's very, very similar. Are they willing to keep trying and working at it? Because if you fail less, that's also progress. If I binge 3,000 calories this weekend for two days in a row, and then next weekend I binge only one day for 3,000 calories, I made a, a huge amount of progress. Yeah. yeah. And people don't see that, right? They don't see those incremental gains and they want – to think of this as a, as a flip of a switch. So I'm bad and I'm suddenly going to become good. And obviously that's not how it works. That's not how habits change. That's not how habits are built. You don't get abs overnight. You're not going to change your habits overnight either. Right. And that's just the way we found over the years that that makes the biggest difference. And obviously going back to your question, the simple answer is coachability, right? Is someone really open to actually getting through this change and, and challenging their own mindset and being willing to work with someone to go deep and see what those wirings are there that we can unwire and, and rewire in the right way. Yeah, man. I mean, there's there's so many great things in there that um, I'll, I'll kind of unpack a couple of them, but I think me and you have very similar similar approaches and, and similar things that we talk talk about with our clients. I love how you started off talking about not or having the right expectations um, and the right approach. And one of the things is you, you talked about is it's not about being perfect, like nobody's going to be perfect. Uh, and one of the phrases that I use is like, people who are really healthy and, and really fit, they're not perfect all the time, they self correct really quickly. So when they do one thing really badly, they if they have a bad meal on Thursday night, they don't say screw it to the rest of the week. They work out hard on Friday morning and have a good breakfast or, you know, whatever it is um, and change a relationship with failure. Only way to fail is to fall out of effort. All that stuff is awesome. Um, and I could talk about that stuff all day long. But I think as we as we both kind of talked about programming is obviously super important and having the right workouts and, and having the right nutrition education and the right nutrition plan is super important. But um, I feel like we both really believe in the importance of the mindset and the beha the behavioral and the habit change type of stuff. But I, but I do kind of want to talk a little bit about kind of your approach in regards to fitness and regards to nu uh, nutrition and that kind of stuff. Um, what was maybe the biggest thing that you you've seen in your own body, whether it was your weight loss journey or whether it's now your journey of looking like a badass with your shirt off. Um, what was maybe one of the biggest things that you've realized in regards to just like working out that you've, that you changed the style of your workouts because you saw how big of a change it was. Yeah, this is a good point. So one of the biggest things for me was, I was really afraid of gaining weight. So for me, when I finished my transformation, when I lost about 45 pounds uh, initially, so I dropped around 200 down. I, I was as lean as 154 at some point, five feet, 10. That was a really challenging situation for me because I thought, I mean, first and foremost, I was skinny. I was, I was still kind of skinny fattish. I had still a little bit more fat on me. So I didn't really look the way I wanted to look. I thought if I get down from 205 down to 180, I'm going to look like a rock star. You know, I, was, I thought, oh, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to look like incredible, like these, uh, you know, magazine people you see like men's health and whatever. But then I was, okay, 180 down to 170, still not there. Then 160, still not there. Then <laughs> like 154, I'm like, okay, am I going to go down to 145? Like what's going on here? I realized that it was the fact that I just simply did not carry enough lean body mass. I did not have enough muscle on me. And then there was that challenging situation there, which which happened after the initial transformation is how do I actually build that muscle? And, and that was 
in my mind, losing the weight was the biggest challenge. I always thought that was that was the problem. But and most people realize this over time in their journey is that actually gaining muscle is a lot harder. And it gets a lot harder as the more you have it, obviously, it's harder to gain as you're close to your genetic potential. So yes, we are focused on losing weight. And that's for your health is extremely important to get lean and, and, and do all that stuff and it massively improves your physique and everything else and how you look, how you feel. But gaining muscle is actually the, much more difficult. It takes more patience. It takes longer. So for me, that transition what I would call from perma cutting, where, where I was stuck for a very long time, was one of the hardest things to do mentally. Because as soon as I would gain three, four pounds, I'm back to a deficit. I'm cutting again because I feel like I'm gain, getting fat. And there was that massive amount of fear. And I was stuck in this for quite some time before I realized, okay, it's time to take a step back. Maybe I'm doing something that you can't fix in one step. Maybe I need two steps. Maybe I do need to commit to a, a lean muscle building phase for a while and obviously control how much I'm going to gain, but then do a fat loss phase again. Because I didn't realize that there's a sequence to the, these things. I didn't realize that there's actually those different phases. I just thought I'm going to lose the weight. I'm going to look great. Not the case. And that's, I think, one of the biggest strategic differences that really changed everything for me. Once I actually gone through that phase, I've started getting closer to my drink potential, I started building that first 10 pounds of muscle. Suddenly, my physique looked incredible. At 165, I looked way better than I'd looked at 155. Crazy difference. And, and I actually looked leaner and bigger at the same time, which was pretty <laughs> crazy to me. And I didn't realize that you, know, you, you can actually improve your physique so much in just 10 pounds difference. So those are some of the things, the pivotal things that at the beginning of the journey, and I see this with clients now, a lot of clients, they... Before they work with me, they go through these crazy fasting periods or they go through these crazy crash diets. They lose a lot of weight. So they, they, they wait to do progressive resistance training after they lose the weight, right? Yeah. They're, they're just thinking about, I'm going to just do a bunch of cardio, a bunch of walking, cut the calories. And I'm going to do resistance training later just to be in a position where they've gone from overweight to skinny fat and then having a really hard time then building muscle or committing to that muscle building phase after so you have no idea how to how to do that so i think for me that was the pivotal moment in my journey that that really solidified the physique because when i built that muscle and then i continued building more muscle after that i realized as a natural lifter my job is to be the least amount of time in a calorie deficit that i can right if i can spend the majority of the year so eight to ten months in in a moderate surplus or low to moderate surplus try to gain muscle get stronger and spend little time cleaning that up and then continuing to gain again this this is the winning formula for me and then since that i mean that's the approach that i've used and recent i mean I haven't been in a fat loss phase since 2019 um because every time i want to do a fat loss phase very short so i do yeah. like eight weeks clean up, go back to gaining slowly. And as an entrepreneur, again, this serves me now because first of all, I have a lot of muscle built up already, which is great. So I already look pretty decent, even a high body fat percentage, but I also don't have to suffer through that deficit because it is pretty tough. If you go to aggressive deficit, I don't have to suffer through it very long and I can have high energy levels. I'm pretty, you know, overall, my diet is very optimized for this. So once you finish that big long cut once, you got to be very careful not to regain a lot of body fat quickly and just do that prop that transition there do that properly and not get stuck in perma cutting either because either one of those two things will really hold you back for a long time yeah we'll talk a little bit about your your current new your current nutrition philosophy and your current nutrition approach for yourself in regards to how you are trying to put on muscle while not putting on fat because i feel like that's you know most people's overall goal yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. I mean, most people kind of gone through, um, even if you tried the bulking approach, you realize that it makes no sense. You just put on a lot of weight that is not going to be muscle. It's going to be a lot of body fat there. By the time you get rid of the body fat, you get back to the same amount of muscle that you would have gained anyway. So it makes no sense. Uh, these days I take it, I mean, because I've been lifting now, it's, it's been a very long time, right? It's been 10 years, 11 years. So like, at this point in time, my muscle gaining progress is extremely slow. There's yeah. no point for me to start gaining anything like two pounds a month or anything. I barely gain a pound a month. Yeah. That There's no point. I mean, after 10 months of gaining, that's already too much. So even that, I try to get maybe up by five, six pounds, seven pounds, and then see where I'm at. 
If I need to clean up a little bit and then continue again. So it's very tiny surpluses above. I'm also a really big fan of, of having a high energy flux, uh, meaning that my balance between the calories that I, that I expend and calories that I intake, I try to raise both of those. So I try to walk a lot. So I, I'm a big proponent of walking. Most people know this if they follow my YouTube channel. I'm a big fan of walking at least, 10, you know, I do seven to 10,000 steps a day. I usually try to admit 10,000. And I'm training very frequently, which then allows me to input a lot of calories and not gain almost any weight. And mm -hmm. that way I can raise my overall energy levels and throughout the day, I feel amazing. I feel really strong in the gym, but I'm not gaining any body fat. So instead of being a couch potato and just being sedentary and having to control my calories, I found higher activity levels actually serve me much better. And I don't mean spending three hours in the gym. I mean, if I'm training you know, four, five, six times, I usually do five to six times per week in the gym. Some of those sessions are 30, 40 minutes. Some of them are an hour and 15, depending on what the schedule allows. But yeah. I'm trying to train more frequently because I'm also training higher frequency because at this point in my journey, I'm, I'm hitting each body part three times a week, right? So I'm trying to really maximize that frequency and, and higher quality volume because if I crush myself in one single session, yeah. it just doesn't make any sense. I'm not growing for longer than 24 hours, 48 hours. I mean, even I, I wouldn't say 24 hours is also pretty long at this point in the journey. Yeah. Um, well, so you, so you talked a little bit about walking. So I want you to kind of Talk a little bit why why walking is such a big thing for you and why you encourage other people to to implement it into their lifestyle as well. For me, it actually started as a way to sleep better at night. Like I had one thing that I really found because I work a lot and I'm spending a lot of time on a computer and I actually do a lot of the work late into the day as well, just because you know when because some of these things I wouldn't say it feels like work. It's just I'm just on there all the time. I'm learning, I'm studying and doing things like that. And I've thought well, let instead of me listening to these podcasts and doing all these readings at, at, in, the, in the house. Why don't I just walk? Why don't I just go out for a walk and then spend an hour like that? And then I realized that I'm not just getting better sleep. I'm also retaining the information more. I'm, I'm chewing through books like crazy. I mean, I'm, I can go through a book a week if I want to, no problem. And it's just starting to add so much to my life. And then I'm also able to lose body fat if I want to very easily. I don't have to cut calories as much. I can eat more without gaining anything. So it just adds so much value to my life, de-stressing me. It's just an incredible activity. And also as a social activity as well, if I'm going to do with my girlfriend, or if I'm going with other people as well, it's, it's a really fun thing to do after a dinner or after a meal. And overall, like, there's no tax in terms of my fatigue levels. I'm actually finding it, it, it improving my recovery. Yeah. So instead of going into high intensity interval training or cardio, which I have nothing against high intensity interval training, but if you're already doing you know, four or five sessions, six sessions a week of weight training, I mean, where are you going to find the recovery for it? Because we, we all live busy lifestyles. I mean, you, you got to really be able to recover from that. And also with cardio, for me personally, if I do one session, maybe two sessions a week, I find that more than enough. I love to walk more and I actually prefer walking more than things like running just because it's easier on my joints. I'm already doing squatting and doing a lot of lower body work. I'm pretty sore throughout the week and I'm pretty taxed throughout the week. So when I walk, I feel great. And for, it just makes so much more sense. And with clients, a lot of clients might come in with an injury. A lot of clients might come in with you know, just looking for ways to you know, reduce their stress. Again, all these other benefits. So walking just makes so much sense. And I did a couple of videos on it that got me featured in, in men's health a few times. A lot of people reached out and said, thank you so much. I lost this much weight because of walking 10,000 steps a day. Some of them even gone up to 15, which is pretty crazy. And when I think about it, that's a lot of walking. So I'm a really big fan of walking. I mean, in Europe is also a big thing. It depends where you live, right? Depending on different cities in, in the US and how the city is designed, where you stay, you have to really find ways and opportunities to walk but there's always little things you can do yeah, like yeah. you know taking little shortcuts here or there parking the car a little bit further away from the gym to take a walk like th there's always little things you can do and when i see sometimes people fighting for a parking spot in the entrance of the gym it's just hilarious i mean yeah. yeah you came here to train and now you're just gonna try to you know fight someone to, to do a, a little bit of a shorter walk there i mean it just makes no sense yeah no i, I couldn't agree more couldn't agree more. So, uh, want to ask a few more questions here. One of the things that um, you know I experience, I feel like, with people and in having initial conversations right before we get I get started with new clients, is trying to weed out some potentially misconceptions that they have, 
in regards to working out in regards to nutrition and stuff like that. So is there any kind of like most common misconception that you see people having when they, when they come to you or when they ask you questions and stuff like that? Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, look, a lot of people come from a background of, of in the weight loss industry and they're being brainwashed by big companies telling them they need meal replacement shakes, fat burners, spending, you know, three, four hundred dollars. $500 on supplements a month. They're, they're trying to lose 20 pounds a month. They're just doing all these kind of crazy things, right? Um, I'm very honest with people up front about expectations, how long it's going to take and, and what this journey really requires in terms of hard work and, and really committing yourself to long-term change. And this has to be a lifestyle change at the end of the day. I think a lot of people's uh, approaches initially are okay this is going to be a diet you know we're going to do this for you know two three months i'm going to lose the weight and i'm going to go back to whatever this is the mentality that leads to failure i mean you most universally like those that are really committed to a change long term and they want to see they, they see this as a change that is going to last for their lifetime it's going to be an educational journey it's also not just going to be about getting to a place but also really understanding how to ma manage this master this long term i think that that's the ultimate big shift that happens with a lot of clients is they're coming in thinking okay i'm gonna diet but then you shift their minds to the thinking as a lifestyle change a couple of other ones i mean a lot of people think well you can't lose weight if you eat carbs for example you know it's some low carb high carb you know, some people like, I got to do a lot of fasting. Some people that don't like any fasting. So th there's a lot of these things that, you know, some people think they need to do six, seven cardio sessions a week to lose any weight. So they're trying to outrun a bad diet. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the, the negative effects of stress eating and boredom eating and just really understanding how much of that is hurting their results. Uh, a common one is also having, you know, five days perfect and just to then go off the rails in the weekends that's a very very common one like someone is yeah, trying yeah. to be super super tight monday to friday they do everything in their power and then the weekend comes around just the plan just falls apart completely there's drinks there's this and that alcohol is another one as well that affects i, I think what a lot of people don't realize about fitness is just how holistic this change has to be in order to make this a lifestyle because they, they think, look, it's training and nutrition. But then when you start connecting the dots, you realize how a bad night of sleep affects your cravings and your hunger the next day and how poorly you perform in the gym. Or how if you had a really stressful project at work that you actually need to adjust your nutrition and, and your training a little bit to, to manage that stress and see where you're at. That it's okay to take a diet break if you're doing a holiday instead of trying to do it perfectly. That it's okay to do certain yeah. things. Again, there's a lot of things out there that, Put people in a box thinking that there's a single specific way to do this while the reality is we all have our own unique way of approaching it and as a coach again 600 clients 600 different programs yeah yeah i mean there's some similarities but people are unique you have your unique challenges your unique lifestyle and even something that worked for you 10 years ago doesn't mean that it's going to work now if you move to a new city you've got a couple of kids you got into a different career that's a whole different ball game so Really understanding these things, uh, I, I feel like the more holistic we can broaden this, I know we are quote unquote fitness coaches, but we are actually looking at, at, a, at a lifestyle design situation. So how can we put together habits and routines in your lifestyle that are going to serve you for a very, very long time? Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. I love your approach, man. I love it. Um, so down to the last couple of questions here, Mario, real quick. For you personally, and I think I have an idea of what one of them is definitely going to be, but for you personally, what are you? what do you feel are maybe your three most important health habits that you do on a weekly basis? Oh, no, this, these are first and foremost, walking for sure, right? I'm yeah. training very regularly and I'm getting to bed. I'm sleep eight to nine hours a night. So for me, eight to nine hours, if I get less than eight hours of sleep, I, I mean, I don't honestly know how people function um, with less than eight hours. And I, I mean, I have a lot of clients that do like six or seven and they're kind of you know making it happen. Maybe they're wired differently. But if you're training really hard, working really hard eight hours you, you feel reborn every day you wake up you're just absolutely on top of your game 100 percent. so yeah those would be my top three for sure i love it i love it i'm one of those uh people who need to continue to work more on sleep and it's something that i've gotten a little bit better at but i need to get on your level for there uh for that for sure well uh, before i ask the last question mario i want to acknowledge you because i think your approach in regards to making sure that first off clients kind of know going into it that 
they have the right expectations that they're going in with the right approach. They realize it's not just X's and O's, the fitness and, and the, the nutrition program. It's not a diet. It's a lifestyle change. And the I know that you go about it the right way in regards to helping them figure out a way to make it work for their for make it make it work for their life and not just giving everybody a uh, the same old cookie cutter approach. You really tailor it to them and, and make sure that it's something that they can start to implement in their life and uh, and stay consistent long term. So I love it, man. I really appreciate that. Of course, man. Of course. Well, I know everybody's want to, going to want to go learn more about you. So make sure you go to www.tomich.com, which is T-O-M-I-C.com. You can follow him at Mario Tomich. Does it have an H on Instagram? Okay. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Awesome. And then, uh, and then follow you, uh, follow him on YouTube as well. Mario Tomich on YouTube and I'll have all that stuff. Um, linked up in the show notes. Any other place that people should go and uh, learn more about you? That's it. You nailed it. Yeah. Perfect. IG uh, website, YouTube. YouTube is the place that I put out the most content and there's a lot of value in there. If you're looking for, you know, losing body fat, gaining muscle, all that stuff. We talk about lifestyle. It goes much, much deeper. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt, man. Good stuff on there. I was watching some of those videos earlier. Um, well, last question here, Mario, is I think that to get closer to the best version of yourself, it's a, both a constant journey and a unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So again, for you personally, if there are three things that you can currently do or three things that you can currently work on to get closer to that best version of Mario Thomas that you could possi possibly be, then what are the three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Uh, number one, I need to be a little bit better with resting. So I need to definitely learn how to uh, relax a little bit more because uh, I, I tend to be extremely goal driven, uh, very you know, sort of dopamine driven. So that's one of the big ones for me. So I, I rarely take any time off and I'm terrible with taking holidays. I took one holiday in the last for like six years or something. So I'm always on. Wow. Uh, the second one would be, probably be less of a robot uh, to people around me. So that means like, you know, being a little bit more, um, you know, just kind of enjoying the moment and uh, trying to, you know, just kind of chill out a little bit and be a bit more empathetic to what people around me, just having a bit better communication because again, not everybody's wired the same. So in my, in my mind, like something always has to be happening yeah. in order to justify the time. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely understand that. <laughs> that's not how everybody works. You know, it, there's, there's, it's okay not to listen to an audio book and make your eggs in the morning. You know, for yeah. me, I, I understand that. I mean, I want to double down on, on every minute of the day and I kind of have that massive sense of urgency, but I understand everybody's wired the same. So I got to be again more understanding toward that and and i'm working on that and i'm i think i'm getting better at it but that definitely is a process um than that and and the third thing really for me I, long term um i feel like the the biggest part for for all of us is just understanding and and mastering your own emotions in a sense that be disconnecting from the ups and downs and kind of understanding there's always a price to pay in life for success. Like you, you have to undergo some, you got to get out of your comfort zone, right? So for me, in order for me to grow, I know that I have to keep working to find ways to get out of my comfort zone. It's pretty large at this point in time, but I always have to kind of challenge myself. For example, I mentioned the dancing thing. At some point, I'm going to have to start learning to dance. I mean, it's outside of my comfort zone and, and I know it, I'm avoiding it, but I got to do it, right? Some other things like that, that I want to improve my Spanish, for example, like there, there's a lot of little things like that would make me a better version of myself that I, that I understand. Yes, I could justify it. Look, there's the business, there's everything else, but it's always a good idea to try to find something in your life that's outside of your comfort zone and just to throw yourself in, in, in something new. And I think that for me personally, I'm a really routinized person. And I always dial in it and I love my routine. I love my habits. So that change into something new, I think that would be the, the, ver the, the thing that I would have to work on a little bit more as well, just to get into something that's totally different, like maybe martial arts or something that, that is outside of my current scope of competence, just to expose myself to that and uh, just see where it takes me. Yeah, man. I love it. I love it. Those were three great things. Really loved, uh, really loved those last couple uh, for sure. Well, that's all we got today, Mario. That was awesome stuff, man.